Hello everyone and welcome back. Before we begin, I want to make a quick announcement. I have new merch on my shop, I have new print designs, I have these amazing phone cases. I love them so much, so I ordered one for myself. You can choose the type of your phone and order them now. I have also these amazing key holders. You can stick them anywhere you want, like your desk or your wall. But for now guys, let's start with today's video. I have for you 5 scary summer camp stories. Listen closely campers and grab your flashlight, because it's the only thing that might save your life. When I was around 10 years old, my mother sent me away to summer camp for a week with my cousin. I thought it would be fun, because my cousin and I got along very well. The first couple of days in summer camp were fun, just as I'd hoped. I started to get into the flow of how the activities worked and how the other kids were. I generally got along with all of them. While my camp was going on, so was another camp in the same building. The other camp was for children with special needs, and our camp would always have lunch at the same time as their camp would. We'd have lunch together, and everything was always fine. Around the second day of camp, I noticed a girl from the other camp sitting by herself with an intense scowl on her face. I wondered why she was sitting alone while all of the other kids were having fun. She seemed to be ignored. The more I watched her, the more I noticed her strange tendencies. She would whisper to herself while staring into space, and sometimes she would rock slowly back and forth, being the adorable ball of innocence and sunshine that I was, I thought she just needed a friend. Maybe she was talking to herself because no one would talk to her. I decided to approach her. I introduced myself and she didn't acknowledge me whatsoever. I persisted, trying to make small talk by asking her simple questions. What is your name? Was answered with silence. Finally, I gave up and said. Why won't you talk to me? She finally turned her head towards me and looked at me. She said, They can hear us. I thought she was talking about the counselors. I figured she was incredibly shy. I asked her what it mattered if they heard us. Her eyes widened as if she were shocked to hear that I didn't know the answer to that question myself. She told me that they were watching and that they would not want her to talk about them. At this point, I thought she was batshit crazy. I agreed with her, so as to not offend her, until lunch time ended. We went back to our separate camps. I was unable to focus on any activities. I kept thinking about what that girl had said. I could not get my mind off of her even when I went back to my cousin's house. The next day is the reason I never went back to summer camp. I was incredibly anxious to go to lunch and talk to the girl. I was the first person from the camp to enter the cafeteria. I sat by the girl and listened to her whisper to herself. Only she wasn't whispering to herself, she was whispering to them. She said things like, Don't do that. I don't want that. All of them think I'm crazy. And please stop. She said loads of other things. But those are the ones that really stood out to me. She would say those things over and over. I asked her who they were. She jolted her head in my direction and said that she could not tell me. They would hear. Then I made the mistake of asking her why she was afraid of them. Her exact words were, Now you've done it. They're coming for us. They're going to get all of us. She got up and bolted for the doors and left. The whole few days I had known this girl, she always whispered and always moved slowly. Not that day. That day, she frightened me. The fear on her face made me afraid, without knowing what I was afraid of. A little later in the afternoon was the award ceremony for the first half of the week. 
I remembered that I had to go to the bathroom in the beginning of the ceremony. When I returned, the counselor towards the back of the room made me stay in the back so I would not interrupt the ceremony. I was fine with that. I noticed that the girl was sitting in the seat next to me. I don't know how I didn't notice right away, but I didn't. It was like she appeared out of nowhere. She was whispering to me this time, telling me that they were coming today. The counselor nearest to me told me not to pay her any mind. It was too late for that. She was already in my head, or maybe it was they who were in my head. The next thing I know, I'm standing at the front of the room above a girl that was receiving an award. Apparently, I walked all the way to the front to punch her in the face. Her nose bled and the counselor screamed and took me to the back of the room and were about to call my parents. I looked back at the crazy girl and saw that she was laughing at me. Then I looked back at the girl I punched and realized she was the one that picked on the crazy girl on a daily basis. The crazy girl was by my side. I had not noticed her because I was still trying to understand what just happened to me. The girl turned to me and told me not to worry. My head was spinning. I was so confused. That's when the girl suddenly stiffened and stared at the ceiling. She screamed, They're here! They're here! at the top of her lungs. At that exact moment, all of the lights went out. This was a massive blackout of 20 or 3 New York. The rest of that week, I could hardly sleep. The girl was no longer at summer camp, and when I asked about her, no one knew who I was talking about. Apparently, there were loads of kids that whispered to themselves in that camp. I even asked the girl that I punched. She told me to get away from her. I always tell myself that it was a coincidence that the blackout happened when she said they were here. Maybe she got sick and could not return to camp. Maybe her parents needed the money and took her out of the camp. Maybe they had something to do with her disappearance. Maybe I invented the girl to keep me company while I sat alone at lunch and whispered to them. I tell this story to people any time we're out in the woods and they always make me stop telling it because it makes them want to leave. I can't really blame them. So after high school, I went to work at the summer camp up in Backwoods, Ontario. If you're not from Ontario or have never been, just understand that after a certain point, the whole province is just deep woods that basically go on forever. It's all just pine trees and quiet lakes, many of which have no people around for miles. This camp has been running out of my hometown for years. It mostly services kids with behavioral and emotional problems, usually from bad or at least very poor homes. It gives them a good experience for the summer and lets them get away from home for a while. It's super low budget though, and it's basically just a couple of buildings out in the middle of nowhere on our own private lake. So this camp is really old and has a lot of traditions, one of which is a now somewhat infamous ghost story. It's too long to tell here, but essentially what happens is that two brothers who trapped in the area 150 years ago fall for the same woman and after getting into a fight, the jealous brother accidentally decapitates the other with an axe. After hiding the body, he is haunted by the ghost and eventually dies from a heart attack while the now widowed woman waits in the woods for her dead husband in the wedding dress until mysteriously disappearing, leaving only a bloody dress behind in a tree. We tell this story near the end of the week and set up a scare for the kids. It's a big sadistic, but it's all in good fun and the kids get over it. Now. The day before this story is told, the kids all go out with their counselors and have an overnight sleeping trip in the woods. We obviously save the story for later, since there's no way you'd spend a night in the woods after hearing it. I was a lifeguard at the camp, so I stayed behind at the camp while a couple of others to respond to any health emergencies that happened on the trips. All that usually happens is a kid gets stunned by a bee or gets sick 
Nothing really serious, not usually. On the second last week of the summer, the kids all went out in the trip and I stayed back, same as any other week. The four of us who stayed back were sitting in a mess hall, playing cards and chatting, when a call came in over the radios. It was from one of the campsites on the water. The sites are spread all throughout the area and this one is across the lake, accessible only by canoe. The counselor says that one of her kids is losing his mind. Getting information over the radios is really hard, since they're just short range and the signal cuts out after a certain distance. From what we could understand, the kid said he met someone in the woods who tried to get him to come with him. He got too scared and ran and told his counselor and had almost run away several times while they tried to calm him down. Now, I should mention that a lot of these kids can be trouble. They act up for attention, but this particular kid was one of the quiet, sweet ones. He was only nine and he was very shy. He hadn't given any of us problems all week and was usually starting to make friends at this point. But basically, we take everything with a grain of salt. So a story like this isn't enough to make us call the police. So we walk and decide that maybe this kid should come spend the night back in the main cabin. Kids sleep in there all the time when they're having problems. It's pretty routine. One of the cooks who stayed behind says he'll come with me to get the kid. We start to walk down through the woods to the docks where all the canoes are tied up. It's a calm night and nothing is really moving in the woods. The stars are out and everything is still. The forest in this area can be pretty creepy at night, so I'm glad I have company. When all you have to see is a small flashlight, it can feel like you're surrounded by darkness and that there is always something moving off to the edges of your vision. We get to the shore, grab some paddles and hop in one of the canoes. The water is so calm that it looks like mirrored reflecting back the stars. As we get closer, we can see that there are lights on the campsite. We make our way across the lake and come up off the shore. All of the counselors are sitting on the shore, with their flashlights pointed back in the woods, completely lighting up the trees. The kid is huddled up behind them, sobbing and muttering to himself. We dock and stay jokingly trying to figure out what they are doing, asking if they are expecting someone to come walking out of the trees. They aren't laughing. The younger counselor, who are only 15 themselves, tell us that while they were trying to calm the kid down, he started panicking, shooting that she was coming to take him away and telling him that he knew she was in the trees. The head counselor took me aside and said that they had all seen something walking between the tents, but when they all turned their flashlights on it, they could not see anything. She was trying to stay calm but her pupils were enormous and her hands were shaking a bit. The whole time the cook who came with me has been trying to calm this kid down who had not stopped freaking out since we got there. He had wet his pants but hadn't seemed to notice. I tried to make a case that it was totally possible that there was someone in the woods and that maybe it wasn't safe to stay out but she wanted to stay there. Plus waking up all of the kids in the middle of the night Packing up camp and canoeing them all back across the lake just wasn't practical. My boss would have killed us if we did all that because some nine-year-old had a bad dream. We decide instead that we should take this kid back and let him sleep inside a building so he can relax. Myself, the cook and this kid climb into the canoe and after checking one last time to make sure things were okay, set off back across the lake. Once we were out in the middle of the water, the kid seemed to calm down. We tried talking with him and he seemed to relax a bit. He tells us about the woman he saw. He said that he had woken up because he thought he had heard his mother calling him from out in the woods. He got out of his tent and walked a bit back and said that he saw a woman standing there. He said she was really tall and skinny and that her hair was messy. He said. She had antlers, like a deer. She had asked him to come help her in the woods, and when he had refused, she got mad. She started to walk towards him, and he got scared and ran, 
and started forcing his way into the counselor tent. We joke that sometimes a wood can make you see stuff and that maybe it was all a dream. He pushed back against this idea at first, but then said that maybe we were right. He was pretty mature for his age, and I think he was starting to get a bit embarrassed about wetting his pants. He started to downplay the situation a bit. When we were about 40 meters from shore, the cook, who was sitting at the front of the canoe, flip off the flashlight so we can see the dog. The kid immediately loses his mind, he says. She's on the shore, with her hands outstretched at him. He starts shrieking like I've never heard before. It was like he was being tortured, pure fear and adrenaline. He has no idea what to do and stands up, almost tipping our canoe. He's screaming, go back, go back, at the top of his lungs and trying to walk to the back of the canoe. We stop paddling and I try to calm him down, but it isn't working. He's rocking us really bad and I am worried we're all about to go overboard. I tell him we will go back if he sits down and he does, but doesn't stop pleading for us to make her go away and shouting that she can't have us. We paddle backwards and start heading for the alternate boat to launch further down the water. I try to talk to him, but he's beyond himself with fear. I try to talk to the cook, but he isn't responding to me. He stopped paddling and I am struggling to move all of us by myself. Eventually, he puts his oar back in the water, but he still won't respond to me. We paddle down and when we get back to the shore, I have to remind the cook turn on the flashlight so we don't hit any rocks. He is hesitant but eventually turns it on. The kid is still scared, but he doesn't see anything and we dock. The alternate boat launch is further up the road, so we have about a 10 minute walk along a gravel road to get back to the camp. The kid grips my arm as hard as he can and I basically have to drag him up the road. Now, up until this point, I have been pretty relaxed about everything. It's all been a bit unnerving, but my job is to be the calm and rational one in emergency situations, so I'm making it my responsibility to be a calming presence for the kid. But when we were about halfway back, things changed. The kid stops in his tracks and asks if we hear her. He says she is whispering for him to follow her and that she wants us to and he pleads with us to not go with her. I entertain the idea and stop to listen, just to try and reassure him that he don't hear anything. But I heard something. I can't fully describe it. It was sort of a humming noise but much softer. It sort of swelled and got quieter. I looked at the cook and he is now visibly afraid. The sound started to get louder and seemed to be coming from all directions. It had a rhythm, like breathing. The kid starts to bolt and the cook is right behind him. I follow close behind, feeling the noise rising behind me and getting closer. The cook literally picks the kid off his feet and runs with him in his arms because the kid could not keep pace. We come up on the camp and the cook runs straight for the main cabin. He throws the door open and tries to slam it in my face, but I push through and he closes it behind me. The others hadn't waited up for us and the cabin was empty. We're all panting and the kid is now wheezing from crying so much. We coax him into the infirmary get him a spare set of seats and a pillow and let him sleep in the court in there. He asks us not to go, but we tell him that we'll be right outside the door if he gets scared. The two of us go sit at a table in the mess hall. Neither of us spoke right away. After a minute, the cook looks up at me and tells me he saw something down at the water. I asked him what and he said it was like a silhouette on the dock. He said it was big in pure black and the light from the flashlight seemed to pour into it. He asked if I saw it and I told him I hadn't seen anything. He asked if I had heard it on the road and I said I had. I told him that all I heard was the humming noise but he was confused. He said he didn't hear the humming, he had heard a person. He said it was like a distant call at first but quickly it got so close that he thought it was right next to him. He said it was a voice, 
but speaking without any tone or rhythm, and thought the words were nonsense, like hearing a language you didn't understand. It sounded like a woman. We stayed up the entire night in a mess hall. Neither of us wanted to go outside to walk back to the cabins. We didn't mention it to any of the other staff, except for the counselor from the lake. She said that after we left, nothing weird happened and that she had mostly forgotten about whatever happened at her campsite last night. The kid begged us to let him go home, but we ended up making him stay. He was a problem the whole rest of the week. He became rude and distant, especially to the other kids. He would not stop talking about what had happened, and we eventually made him stop because he was scaring all of the other campers. I really can't account for what happened last night. I never had anything like that happen after. I even went back for a second summer, and nothing similar happened. I know what I heard though. I have no idea what could have made that noise, but it was the most unnatural sound I've ever heard. The kid did not come back the second summer, and neither did that cook. I saw him a year later while out of the bar, and after some chatting and catching up, I brought up what had happened that night. He got really upset and stormed away and did not talk to me for the rest of the night. I think he really believes what he saw out there. I don't know what to believe about it. So every summer, I go to this camp, deep in Pennsylvania, called French Creek Bible Camp. I was with grade 11 to 12 age group. There's been many stories passed around over the years about evil creatures living in the woods. One's a goat man. He was described to be like the devil himself, having red eyes. Some claim they saw him. I never believed them though. There used to be five different sleeping bags at the campsite. Three for guys, two for girls. But a couple of years ago, sleeping area five burned to the ground one night, while people were camping there. No one knows how the fire started. The cabins don't even have electricity. And the fire officials said it wasn't a forest fire that caused Unit 5 to burn down. That was strange enough. Now, in Unit 4, the furthest away from civilization, one night our cabin door swung wide open and crashed against a wall as though somebody tried to kick it in. But we shined a flashlight outside and investigated. We didn't see anyone though. We told some people the next morning, but didn't think much of it. Keep in mind, the weather is still. Was this a sign that we shouldn't be there? This is where stuff got insane. It was the second to last night before we're supposed to go home. Once again, the weather's calm. It's around 2.30 when my entire cabin was awoken by the loud sound of our wooden door slamming open again. Moments later, we hear a loud cracking noise. I notice a large tree next to our cabin is falling towards us. I believe that. In the split second I looked out of the window and at the tree, I saw something dark fleeing the area. The tree then fell onto our cabin, crashed through the roof onto my cabin mate's bed. If I had not looked through the window, he would have been crushed to death. The tree's over a hundred feet tall. Everyone in the surrounding area come to see what happened and made sure that we're all okay. We looked at the tree, it was cut cleanly across the bottom as though somebody did it with a chainsaw. But there was no one close. We would have heard the cut in. This is silent. It's impossible. I truly believe that someone or something was trying to kill us or punish us that night. Needless to say, I had my mum take me home right away after that and have never been back since. First, 
I want to give some background before I start the story, so you have an idea of the circumstances and surroundings in my experience of this camp. Last summer, I worked at a girls' summer camp as kitchen staff. The kitchen staff were responsible for feeding around 300 people between two kitchens. We had our own cabin with four rooms shared amongst 12 of us. I shared my room with two other girls who went to bed fairly early in the night. I happened to stay up later than the rest of my cabin mates, reading with a flashlight in the dark. I never experienced anything strange when we were all awake. It was only when I was alone, so to speak. On some nights, everything would seem entirely too quiet. There would be no rustled trees from the wind. I couldn't hear the nearby lake, nor any animals, which was strange. There were always animals around normally. It wasn't uncommon to see a raccoon searching the trash cans for scraps late at night. It was on these nights that I would hear strange sounds. Small little clicks that sent chills up my back and made me look around the room for anything that might be causing the noise. I wanted to slow my heart and stop my head from spinning, terrifying possibilities to keep me awake. I could usually brush these occurrences off. However, there are few instances I could not shake. It always happened when I decided to close my book and my eyes to try to sleep. A loud and muffled noise made me jolt awake. I opened my eyes and saw something. A shadowy figure stood over me. Its presence felt suffocating. The figure was strangely human, yet distorted, and with no features. I think it was solid. No, solid wasn't the right word. Think of mercury for a moment. How is a very dense fluid? The shape seemed to quiver strangely. If reached out, I could touch it. However, I felt if I did, I'd be swallowed up, the mass absorbing me, suffocating me. Besides, it didn't matter. I could not move. It was as if I was paralyzed or something had bound me to the bed. The only thing I could do was watch as it watched me and try to cry out for help, but my words or screams caught in my throat like the lamb you get when you're crying. I heard my heart pounding in my ears, the blood rushing through my body. It's funny how much it sounds like a river or the wind. Suddenly, the room felt entirely too hot, overbearingly so then dropped off, making my limbs feel stiff with cold. Finally, I managed to squeeze my eyes shut. I sat up, swallowed the lump that had formed in my throat, and took a look around the room. Everyone was still sleeping. I expected it to look different somehow, like something had been moved, or that my cries and struggles had been noticed. But nothing changed. I was sweating, though, proof that I had indeed been straining to move. That happened a total of three times. It always felt like it took an eternity. That trapped feeling, unable to move or call for help. But when I glanced at the clock, only a few minutes had passed. I am a 19 years old named Sarah, and I am born and raised in Germany, where I still live. So for my summer break, I wanted to leave Germany, but without spending much money. And so I searched for summer camps in the US and found a language program camp. It looked fabulous. I teach German, get on excursions with them, and I would have a great time. I flew over to a state. I have no idea where it was, nor any other information. I didn't really care. It started off as a normal camp. The people working there were all amazing. I was the youngest though, also the only German teacher too, but it didn't bother me at first. I had a lot of miscommunications with the other teamers, which made me have a lot of trouble sometimes, because I came across rude when I was genuinely concerned about someone and asked if everything is okay. But that's not even the thing I want to tell you about. It happened in my last two weeks. Only three children applied for German. Two were siblings, a girl and a boy. They were lovely. And a Chinese boy, he was 15. The Chinese boy, let's call him Jack, was a troublemaker. 
When he didn't want to do anything, he wouldn't. He would just stare at me with an angry expression. Me and the other teamer had no idea how to handle it, so we decided on just let him be. He would get bored during classes and eventually join the lessons. It was fine, and we only had class at three hours in the morning, so it was fine. The last week changed everything though. The siblings had to leave, because their father got a new job, and they suddenly had to move, so they took them, and I was left alone with Jack. He was a quiet kid to begin with, his German was very advanced, even when he never really used it, since he never spoke much. On our first day, I told him we draw a comic together, I would do it too, because I could not sit there and do nothing of course. At first, he didn't want to do it, so I draw one alone, and in the end, I saw him drawing something, so I was very relieved. He never asked me questions on how to build a sentence, so I thought I'd just collect his notebook in the end and correct it myself, and talk it through with him the next day. But when the time passed and he finished, he didn't want to show me, nor let me see it. He clutched the book onto his chest and sat there. I was fine with it, and we looked at mine. He never read the small bubbles, I forgot about his book. The next day the only thing we would write down was a diary entry. Another team recommended it to me. It would take some time and keep him busy for a certain amount of time. Of course, he wouldn't let me see it. As the day passed, rumors started to spread out about Jack that he was wandering around at night, alone. How he was seen at the teamers' cabins, looking inside the windows. The other kids started to get scared of him. We didn't do much about it. Whenever the night watch caught him, they would send him to bed. The days dragged on with it. At one point, it was the day before our last lesson, so I was really trying to get the workbook, so I correct everything we did the last days, so he can see what kind of mistakes he made. Also, I wanted to write notes on how to know to make certain mistakes again. In the end of the lesson, I snatched the workbook out of his hands, and he was furious. He screamed at me, telling me to give it back, but I didn't give in. When I got the time in the evening to look through it, I was shocked. If I find the book, I'll upload pictures, but I don't really want to find it. I saw the comic at first. It contained only two pictures. The little would have been translated to me. My teamer. I was flattered when I read this, but got shocked not a second later. The first picture was me as a stick figure. The next one was him stabbing me while I was sleeping. His diary entries were just as creepy as his comic. He described his day watching me and how he intended to kill me. Then I saw the body he drew. Sarah was reading on top of it, and underneath was a body drawn. It was crooked, and he described the body parts he would put his knife into. I was scared. I showed it to the other teamers, and they were just as confused as me. What kind of teaching I did? Maybe my English was too bad. But they didn't understand. The night came, and it was my turn to be the night watch. I was a little bit anxious, so when everyone went to bed at around 1 a.m., I was left alone in the office. But then I saw him. Jack. He was wandering around in the dark. He was walking towards our hut. I knew it was locked, since we always did it. One key was hanging inside next to the door, and the other key was with me. I followed him. I was curious. Jack walked towards the door of the cabin, tried to open it, but realized it was locked. I was hiding behind a tree, I know, not a good hiding spot, but good enough considering that it was night, and the only light came from the office. Suddenly, he saw the paper in front of the door, telling the kids who was on night watch and who they are supposed to look. If they had any problems, he turned around, walking towards the office. I know that I should have called out for him, since I was in charge, and if he had any problems, I was the one who had to handle them. But I was too nervous. After I read what he had written down into his workbook, I saw him walking into the light of the office lamp and saw it. A knife! I jumped out of my hiding spot and ran forward to the teamer's hut. I didn't have the key with me, so I banged at the door for someone to open it. Eventually, someone opened and I told Sam what happened. 
He looked like he didn't believe me, but agreed on checking on it. When we arrived at the office, Jack was gone. We went into the boy's hut. Sam went first, and there was Jack, pretending to be asleep. I knew he was acting, because I saw him one minute earlier. But Sam didn't believe me, called me crazy. I told the other the next day, but of course, nobody believed me. They said there's no need to investigate. Jack and I would leave the camp today. The lesson that day was silent. Jack stared at me, and I stared back. I hope I will never in my life see him again. I am originally from India. My parents sent my sisters and I to an Indian camp so we could learn more about our culture. At the time, I was around 14 years old. I was a standard, young, cute kid. I had been going to this camp for a couple of summers, and this particular summer was an important one. The teachers were extremely excited because they had a yoga guru of some sort visiting. I think he's about 60 years old at the time. He would teach us traditional music and dance. He started noticing me right away and kept on making comments about how great I was doing. As the summer continued, I would frequently find him watching me and talking to the teachers about me. Whenever he fixed my pose, he would linger for a while. These things kept on happening. I then become hyper aware of his presence. Flash to the end of the camp. It's a couple of days before the ending ceremony. A few girls ran up to me and said he has candy in his room. They said that he would give me some if I went up. I really liked sugar. I didn't feel comfortable going alone though, so I had some of the girls go with me. He given them candy immediately, and they all left. When asked for some, he mentioned for me to come inside his room. I shook my head. He kept trying to get me to go inside his room. Finally, he gave up after I wouldn't budge and said that he needed a kiss in exchange for some candy. Something inside me said run. I started backing away and booked it. At the time, I didn't think much of it. I just knew that something in the situation wasn't right. I think I told my parents because we never went back to that camp again. Hello there, and thank you so much for listening. If you like this video, please leave a thumbs up, and if you like my videos and want to see more, subscribe to my channel, and I